Hey Lauren, thank you very much for coming over, uh, especially coming from Central Oregon. It's a long trip, so I really appreciate you bringing these two amazing Greaves motorcycles. Yeah. Would love it if you could share a few words with us about your bikes. Awesome, yeah, and I, uh, you know, we've been locked down for so long, but it's nice to get out of the house <laughs> and uh, come talk about motorcycles. Um, and it's kind of overcast, so it's a perfect day to talk about Greaves. Let's go through both these bikes. So this is a 1967 Greaves Challenger. I was into Triumphs. I was into Yamahas and Hondas for a long time. And I decided that uh, I wanted to stick with British bikes and I wanted a two stroke because the four strokes were just kind of complicated to work on. And I wanted to be able to race them and enjoy them, trail ride on them. So I met somebody in Central Oregon that actually had a Greaves and he let me ride it one day. I had heard of them, but I wasn't really that familiar with them. I'd certainly never ridden one. And after I rode it, I thought this would be kind of fun. And, and I asked him, you know, how does one go about getting these in the United States? They seem like they'd be hard to find because I've never seen them. And he said, oh, I know somebody that's selling one. So we went to a race and there was uh, one for sale in the back of the pickup for 500 bucks. Oh, so I wow. picked it up. And, you know, it turned out to be more of a pile of parts than an actual restorable bike. Uh, but I started to take it apart, learned a lot about the engine and how it worked. Um, I was able to sell some of the parts off of it to finance another one. And then this one came available. Um, it was not in this condition, but it was complete. And it was up in Northern Idaho, Rathburn, Idaho. And so I traveled up there. Um, I probably paid a little bit too much money for it in my opinion, but I was really excited about it. And so I uh, drove up there, brought it home, um, kind of stripped it down and started to go through everything just to make sure that everything was uh, mechanically sound. Got the bike running and then was able to ride it a little bit. The guy that I bought this from, Don, he gave me a picture of him sitting on this bike in 1967 when he just bought it. And then I got another picture of him when I bought it, of him sitting in the same position on this bike and it was pretty cool. I actually wrote to him after I got it all done and said, hey, I'll bring it up to you and you can ride it around if you want. And I never heard back from him, unfortunately, but it would be cool if he could ride it again. But he bought this bike and he gave me all of his trophies, so he was doing something with it. Oh, amazing. Um, he has some wheelie trophies that he'd won and some motocross trophies. And then he put it away in his garage. When I picked it up, it had been sitting in the garage for about 25 years. And the tank was all the way full to the filler neck oh. with fuel. Oh my goodness. So the, the tank was like mushy. Yeah. I mean, it was real, I, I was worried that it was going to pop. You wanted to just drop out. <laughs> but yeah, he, uh, everything else though, he took pretty good care of it. So that was nice. Mechanically, it had the proper oil and everything in it. So I am not a Greaves historian, <laughs> but one of the reasons why I really like this brand is it's just kind of quirky. Um, the way that they look, it's got kind of an agricultural look to it, an industrial look to it, especially with the leading link front end. The Greaves story is Burt Greaves and his cousin, Derry Preston Cobb. Derry was actually in a wheelchair from birth. And so Burt and his cousin, they started building these Invicars. Yeah. And they were like, uh, almost like a carriage, an open yes. roof carriage with an engine on the side, uh, an agricultural engine from Villiers and they made a lot of money with those because it was post-war and there were soldiers returning that needed these and so they actually had a pretty good business going with it. Have you ever seen one of those in the cars? They were all over the place when I was growing up. They were very distinct looking, you know, they have a distinctive color to Absolutely. them. Absolutely. They're a funny looking little thing, just like you say, like a little carriage, yep. like a chair, yep. uh, three wheelers if I'm not mistaken from what I remember. Correct. They made a good run. They had some government contracts, I think, with the Invicars, and they made a lot of money. Um, and it was always the dream of Bert to get into motorcycle manufacturing, from what I've read. Um, so he started with a couple of prototype motorcycles, and he really wanted to use racing as a way to engineer the bikes and develop them. I thought it was pretty smart. It's free marketing if you're winning. And um, so he got into racing pretty early on. And, you know, back then it was scrambles and it was uh, trials and it was um, international six day trials type events, endurance events. And uh, so he got into 
some of the scrambles early on. And by the late 1950s, he got Brian Stonebridge involved. And he was the engineer from BSA that wanted to get into two strokes, but BSA didn't want to do two strokes. Oh. And so he was able to go over to Greaves and he helped develop the first scramblers. The uh, MCS, the motocross special, is what Greaves produced. He died tragically in 1958 in a car accident. And then they got Dave Bickers involved in Greaves racing. Before he went to CZ, he was a Greaves rider. That was the nexus of the Challenger, which is what this bike is. So uh, 1964, Greaves came out with the MX-1. Uh, similar to this bike, it had fiberglass front and rear fenders, fiberglass tank, frame was pretty compact like this, and but basically it was about the same. It did have a fork like this one before they switched to these, which are called banana forks. Um, yeah. People always call them Earl's forks, but they're not Earl's, they're not BMW, they actually are Greaves specific. That was the nexus of the Challenger. And this bike had some problems with the gearbox, which I've also experienced. They just were kind of fragile bikes. They did some transitioning with different gearboxes and figured out a good combination for it. Experimented with different cylinder heads. Uh, they went from the Villiers powered engine, which the, uh, the lower end on these Villiers is rated for about 17 horsepower. And the top end on the motocross bikes was 24, 25 horsepower. And so when they went to motocross on these, they were breaking a lot of cranks and they were having issues with those, with the bearings. So they were able to switch to their own proprietary bottom end. Uh, they went with an alpha crank and that really strengthened it up and made it possible to really hammer on it when they were, or give it the beans when they were racing. So the Challenger is a good scrambling bike. You know, in the United States, in the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, the big thing was desert racing. And these bikes became very popular in desert races in the West Coast. Uh, because of this front end, you know, these forks are pretty much indestructible. And to rebuild the fork, really all you have to do is grease the bearings. It's got zerts on all the contact points. And you just pull the shocks out and replace them if you need to. So these are very robust forks and you can just take them out in the desert and ride wide open and you know really hammer on them lightweight so competing with the triumph desert sleds of the time they were really popular that way you actually see these on the west coast a lot more frequently than you would think and as i was mentioning most of the sales from greaves was coming to the united states during the 60s and 70s and uh, they had dealers there were two main distributors in the united states one on the east coast one on the west coast and nick nicholson was the distributor on the west coast and he actually took information from all of the guys that were racing and he was able to custom build these bikes so he would put together an order and he would send them over to the uk and say hey you know this combination would be really useful over here and actually help develop a lot of bikes wow um, the mx6 uh, is a greaves frame uh, that wasn't available in the UK. It was a US specific frame. Similar to this one, I think it was a little bit longer, but perfect for desert racing. They had uh, telescopic forks that you could uh, order, um, although these were popular with desert racers from what I understand. And they also developed a US specific uh, flat track bike that uh, had a short stroke and was pretty, pretty popular in the club circuits and, and racing flat track events. Another thing I love about Greaves, you know, these were these were bikes that a lot of the the big names in motocross started out on. Malcolm Smith started out on a Greaves. You know, he had other bikes leading up to it, but he raced on a Greaves early on in his career before switching to Husky. Um, Joel Robert um, had one for a fairly short period of time. Bickers obviously was probably the, the biggest name in racing before he switched to CZ, which from what I understand was simply the gearbox problem oh. because the, the CZs had that uh, cassette style uh, transmission that you could just pull out and fix and they were super strong Soviet steel. I don't know what magic they put in those, <laughs> but uh, some kind of uh, radioactive material or something. So he switched to CZ. Um, and in, in the U.S., there was a lot of riders that were racing on these well into the 70s. Uh, Jim Wilson, 
uh, was was a, on the, the Trans Am series of racing popular in the early 70s. Um, and so Greaves was able to kind of move into the into the 70s, even competing with some of those other brands that were taken off like the Honda with the CR, you know, that bike revolutionized the industry, but these bikes were just still super fast and they had a following. In addition to the fork, obviously the odd looking fork, you have this cast aluminum uh, beam here, which is mated with the steel frame, subframe going back. And this provides a lot of, it's obviously lighter than steel um, and super strong because it's a square, you know, I-beam yeah. basically running up the front of it. So super strong, super sturdy. And um, it was a material that was pretty readily available post-war. So they were able to put that together, make a pretty inexpensive bike out of it. This bike has been raced. The points cover, magneto cover here actually is supposed to go on and then there's a rubber band that goes on and holds it on. But this one, somebody modified it probably period correct here and they put these little tabs on it holds it on there much better so I really like that the heads on these things aluminum head it looks much bigger than a 250 to a lot of people and because of these deep deep fins here to keep it cool and these asymmetrical heads so if you look at these from the top down these heads have these fins kind of direct airflow back to the uh, spark plug and keep the plug cool um, so it's pretty unique design. Um, this one's got the kidney shaped gearbox, which I've heard people say that the kidney shape is better than the, than the oval shape, um, but I've also heard the other way around. So it's a one up, three down shift pattern. Okay. So it's a four speed. This one is pretty noisy when I was riding it around. So I found a period correct Skyway silencer that I took apart and restored. You can still find these stickers available, so I was able to restore it. And, you know, for a 60s era racer, that's pretty period correct, and I like that. The tank on these typically is fiberglass. I got really tired of having to drain the tank every single time. They start to get soft after a while, even running non-ethanol fuel. I had this one made in India and was very happy with how it turned out. They even they even got this little this little detail here yes. in there which I was surprised about. You had it custom made then? Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Well I sent them a sample. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had you know <laughs> these fiberglass tanks, I had a whole bunch of them laying around. Okay. And I sent them one that had holes all over it and I said, you know, use this as a pattern or yeah. whatever. And so they sent me this back and I think it looks great. So yeah, that's about it on, on this bike. And this is a trials bike. It's geared for trials. This was the TFS model. Um, and I've heard that the TFS is what they call it in the US and in the UK it's called the Scottish. But I've also heard that the TFS in the United States is not actually a Scottish. I don't know, I've heard lots of differing opinions. I call it a Scottish. So this is a Villiers lower end and then this has the Greaves aluminum top end, square barrel top end. Um, it's a 250. It has this kind of automotive style uh, silencer, if you could call it a silencer, because when, when we fire it up, it will not be silent. <laughs> um, I think I got a little bit of an exhaust leak in the front too, which that probably contributes to it, but it yeah. definitely doesn't quiet it down much. <laughs> they had a motocross bike that used a frame like this, the motocross special and the Hawkstone. They found that it did really well in trials as well, so that's what you see here pretty lightweight did really well in trials obviously the front end you can you can turn all the way lock to lock on it turns pretty good pretty compact wheelbase for tight turns this one has the amyl carburetor originally came with um, i believe an su carburetor the person had had the engine restored rebuilt um, here in the u.s and then they had the tank painted and the seat redone and everything was kind of cobbled together, but it wasn't bolted up and it was not yeah. correct. They had the wrong wheel, they had the wrong wheel hubs on it. And they had, <laughs> in order to make the wheels fit, they had notched out, oh. you know, so I, this one took a little bit of work to get it going. 
but it had the things that I really wanted, like the painted tank, some of the more expensive stuff, and the engine obviously being redone. This one also has a speedometer and the speedometer bezel, which, um, you know, those got trashed. If you were riding it in competition, you know, you want to strip everything off and to an 18 year old in the 60s, they'd probably just toss it. So was lucky to find a, uh, one of those and the correct Smith speedometer to go in there. Um, I have used this one in competition, so I do have modern controls. Yeah, I also have the headlight for this one. Don't have it wired up, obviously. There's a little plug for the wiring here that you can just tap into uh, the stator if you want to okay. run lights and everything. Yeah. So. It looks the business, that one, doesn't it? Yeah. When you think about a Greaves, that's the one that this you is, think this about. Is the, yeah, this is the popular one. Everybody likes this bike. And Scottish is the name that was given after the Scottish six-day trials, right? Is yep. that right? Yeah. Yep. They gave this one the Scottish. They gave the, the original motocrosser the Hawkstone moniker because it was raced at Hawkstone okay. and did pretty well there. So this is a fun bike. Obviously, you're doing low-speed stuff on a trialer. You know, I don't have any issues with the engine. However... This one does have the points and the condenser are in here and it tends to get really hot. So if you ride it all day, you know, we have trials events in the U.S. in the heat of the summer, which I kind of weird. Um, I would prefer to do them in the fall when it's cooler. Um, I think that would be more in the spirit of the, of the <laughs> sport, but I may probably relocate that up under the tank or something so it can stay a little bit yeah. cooler. So after a few loops in a trials event, it'll get hot and it won't want to start very easily. So you can gear these things. It's a four speed transmission and it's got a pretty long throw between third and fourth. So, you, you know, you could ride this as a trail bike, which I've done and it's, it's actually pretty enjoyable. Um, and then you can get down yeah. into first and second and really do some technical stuff. So this has been a fun bike. It does have stationary, <laughs> pegs so these do not hold when you're riding so you got to be very careful yes. of that i don't even i don't even know if those are allowed in competition anymore because they're kind of dangerous yeah <laughs> thank you very much lauren yeah, wow that was amazing i never knew so much about greaves before so thank you yeah it's just that kind of a quirky amazing. little brand and i love talking about them <laughs> and would you mind starting them up no, that, absolutely. Would you mind? that would be wonderful. I'd love to hear them. One thing about the bikes that I own is they have to be usable. Yeah. Um, I don't like to just have them sitting in the living room. So Terrific. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lauren, yeah. for coming over. I really appreciate it. That yeah, was this is fun. very kind of you to come all that way. Smells great. It smells great as well. <laughs> 
mean, it sounds good. It sounds great. It's looking good. Awesome. That's not too loud. This is the quiet one though, right? The I love that. I wish we had smelly vision because it smells fantastic. <laughs> that was great. This one's a little bit more temperamental, likes to likes to warm up. Yeah. But then doesn't like to get too hot. Very <laughs> much like in the middle there. So once it gets warm though, it's pretty steady and can take it around a little bit. So that looks like tons of fun that. Yeah. And awesome. the speedometer works. 